Okay, welcome to the first afternoon session. This room is for remote pilotage. I think then all you are in the correct place. And first, we have four presentations. And the first is, did I take it? No, it's here. From other <coughs> university. So, please. Yes, thank you, Sir Paul. Well, good afternoon to everybody. I hope you have a nice lunch. You are ready to get uh, involved into this uh, work that we have done for the risk management and remote pilot operation. Basically, this presentation is going to be started by me talking about the overall uh, aims and why, how we start and why we do that, what are the purpose of applying this uh, risk management uh, analysis that we did. Uh, the, present, the second part of the presentation is going to be by my doctoral students, who Niels was net. I need to say in advance that this is a word that is uh, was basically covered during the last more than two years of work here. So the work produced is huge. We try to summarize here everything what we believe is critical for you to understand on the overall picture. If you want to know more about uh, technical uh, aspects or more details on the analysis that we execute, I hope some questions will be here. But I can also say in advance that uh, there we are already conference papers journal papers, technical reports about this work coming, and also a doctoral dissertation should come uh, in, in next year about this work. So just for you to be aware about this. So I'm going to start talking about, uh, we already hear before what is remote pilotage, and basically just understand what is the pattern of our analysis. If we look into how we consider this remote pilotage, we can just define it here as a uh, su supporting the vessel crew in shape and way the water from shore. So that's basically in a simple way, but we already discussed in the morning. We had several challenges, or there are several challenges to consider here. More than the bullet points that you can see here, I will start. The biggest challenge is that you need to do some <coughs> risk analysis and define the basis for a risk management strategy in something that actually doesn't exist. So we have very limited data to actually utilize the data, the data that we get, actually we need to produce it first to try to understand uh, the, good pick or the, the, the real picture about the, the things that we need to consider. A more specific challenge about the things that we have for remote pilotage, uh, we know that this operation or this service will have a embedded software and advanced uh, new technology to be incorporated there. So that's a kind of like a important challenge to consider. There are a big number of components and functions that have to be defined in order to think about how, how this uh, remote pilot operation can be done in a safe manner. And of course, uh, uh, the challenge is also on, on the integration and, and interactions of, of these components that we have in the, in, the, in, the in, the, in the description of the system that we elaborate. You can see slightly the picture here. It's huge uh, framework and description that you can find. But of course, uh, we cannot go into details on that. But it's a current situation also to understand about uh, how to combine or think about where to start on these challenges is that uh, we have a, a huge challenge on having different components and functions that have to be integrated. And we need advanced uh, safety engineering methods that can actually handle this uh, increased complexity to actually that everybody's capable to understand what is included in the description of our system and how we basically think about uh, defining that, that basis to, to, to control and ensure the to control, to control the risk and ensure the safety of remote pilots. And of course, uh, as I already said, limited data, limited information of these existing uh, similar around the world that we can utilize. So that's basically one of the critical aspects here. What is the aim of the work that we did in the, in the presentation here? I will just say it in a general way. These are kind of like a, uh, bullet points that will mark critical aspects. But basically, what we're trying to do here, or what we did with this risk, Risk uh, analysis and risk management is to basically utilize a uh, systematic framework which is capable to have systemic view on the components of a system included for remote pilotage. Once we have the system description, basically we execute a, a risk analysis, a identification of hazard risk analysis, and, 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 and this risk analysis basically was with the aim of producing the, pre the, the initial control options that we need to basically ensure uh, in, the, in the establishment of, of, of our safety management strategy 
So when I say systematic, we need to, to use a process for this. And we use basically the formal safety assessment, which is basically for everybody who is uh, familiar with the role of IMO and how basically IMO proposed frameworks to introduce new regulations or changes in new regulations. This is the process that you need to follow. For more than the purpose of the, of the formal safety assessment, we also believe that the process of the safety assessment allow you to do different steps that actually are needed to ensure a good way for money risk and to basically develop a, a safety management strategy. Now, so we will go quickly into the steps of this uh, formal safety assessment, but I will basically just to briefly mention about those steps and the, the kind of like a general picture of the work that we did here. We start with the system description, and we believe that this perhaps the most important part at this moment or during this project, because we need to identify first what kind of tools we can utilize to model and describe that system. That was the first step that we did. Once we basically evaluate those tools available for that purpose, we select one and we start to make that system description and this definition of the framework. So that is basically a heavy root on science-based solutions that can be immediately applied into the into into the functional specification of the kind of like a, a activities on an organization, something that can actually go immediately to be used or at least to start the development. Once we did that first step, we started to do the, 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 the risk analysis with also uh, an advanced method, as we will talk briefly about that. There is a heavy criticism for, for not for the formal safety assessment, even though the people still don't like too much the formal safety assessment in the way that is not suitable for what we are trying to do now with the advanced solutions, smart shipping, or autonomous shipping, or smart services, as this one, remote pilotage. Internally, we believe that the problem is not really the formal safety assessment, but the issue may be rooted more into the tools recommended by the formal safety assessment or by, by, by IMO to start to execute the tasks that we have in the formal safety assessment. And that's why we look into more advanced tools that are actually more suitable, not just to focus on those, like, those additional tools that focus on failures, or avoiding the negative impact, but on tools that actually can induce the behavior, the safety behavior that we want in our systems. That's basically something that we did on that. So we did this risk analysis uh, with this uh, advanced method. We define risk control options that Sun Sunil will show on that. Then the cost benefit analysis about estimating what's going to be the impact, difficulty, and, 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 and a kind of like a representation of the potential economical cost and economical benefit of having those risk control options implemented. Once we have that, and for the purpose of defining or affecting regulations or, 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 or the things needed for the, the regulatory framework that adapt these remote policies on that, we will have a specific control that can be transformed into requirements to be embedded into those regulations. That's basically how we see it. Now, Sunil will go step by step explaining uh, the work on, on, on each of these uh, aspects of the process that we execute. Yes, so hello everyone, thank you Osiris. Uh, so I would continue as Osiris mentioned. So it has been a quite a challenge, like Osiris and Sandra said, because of the lack of information about remote pilots in general. So in order to identify what can go wrong in remote pilotage, we have to first know what exactly is remote pilotage, right? So how we started was defining a system description for remote pilotage. What, by that, what I mean is that what could potentially be the components inside the remote pilotage, how would they function, and how would this component interact with each other in order to execute this remote pilotage task. So for that, like I said, first we define the components, which we grouped into three different, based on like three different locations where they are installed. Like what could be the potential components in the soil control center, what could be in the vessel, and what could be in the fairway. And you can see on the picture on the right, like these are the components that are in this uh, soil control center, and also what are the functions and so on. Um, okay, so this was generated using this uh, model based system engineering method called system modeling language, which is like a machine interpretable language. So in, if you want to do like a analysis later on, so it's executable models that can easily use for achieving those analysis. 
Then you can also see the components that has been categorized for the vessel insulation and also in the fairway. The aim here was to have at least as low as possible insulation on the vessel and more on the fairway and the animal biology center. And it was also the focus of this project. So once we defined the components, we then looked into how actually the remote pilots would like uh, function as a process. So what will happen from beginning towards the end? So it, starting from the vessel arrival and request of services, what are the steps necessary for the pilot's preparation? What are the necessary steps for the pilot's planning, pilot's operation, and the pilot's most operation, operation activities like building and so on? So we tried to define each of these steps in detail. Uh, again, the same method was used for this defining as well, so it's kind of simulated. So you can see this is one of the figure for the vessel arrival and request of services, which shows you what are the actors involved in this step, what do they use, and how this activity is like uh, functioning in a step-by-step way. So it starts in this place with vessel group, so they send the safety information in. Mm -hmm. Uh, like the order of order of services, either directly via the directly to the prime dispatch center, or via the vessel agent. And then what happens back and forth in the whole step is uh, shown here. And then also for the prime preparation, what different kind of preparation they need to uh, do in order to like initiate the pilotage, what kind of information they need to receive, and so on. So once we define all the processes, then we started identifying the hazards in the remote pilotage operation, so which is our next step, which is the risk management of remote pilotage operation. So now we have the system description. So the next step was to identify how things can go wrong in this system. So if for this purpose, we utilize this hazard analysis method called system theoretic process analysis, and which is which has difference between conventional methods like uh, fault trees and analysis or failure model effect analysis uh, in the sense that it considers safety a dynamic control problem rather than a failure prevention problem. So what it means is that like, while these traditional methods focus on, it starts with identifying causes behind faults and failures, what it highlights is that we need to start assessing all possible interactions in the system. So even the interactions of non-failing components can result in hazards and losses and so on. So the aim here is to identify first all the interactions in the system. Then we assess them one by one to identify how these can lead to non-safe situations. So as you can see on the right, we first define this kind of control structure. It's a simplified version where you have all the actors involved in the, in the remote pilots, like remote pilot, master, deck officers, and so on. We also have all the components involved, like fairway hub, displays, and so on, also coming from the SIP. And other actors like BTS and other vessel screw, which are not uh, like fully covered in the same list, but the green ones are. So once we know the interactions between these actors and components, what we do is we take interactions, which are mentioned in the downward arrow, which are like the functions of each actor, and we assess them in order to identify unsafe situations. So at the end of this remote, like hazard analysis, we consider six types of losses. So loss of life, injured people, and loss or damage of own ship and cargo, loss or damage of uh, external objects, loss of mission, loss of environment, and loss of customer satisfaction. Then we cover five different system level hazards, like the ship pilot minimum separation is standard in route, and then these are the losses that it could lead to if it happens. <coughs> And then SIP does not maintain safe under clearance, and these are the losses that it can lead to. So you can always trace them back, trace back uh, what kind of system level hazards can lead to the losses. So we define five different system level hazards. And then, like I said, we started assessing each of the interactions, and then we identified more than potentially 150 unsafe actions. For example, as you say one, you can say, like, remote pilot does not insert the communication with master prior to the pilot days. So it means that uh, there's a lack of communication between the actors and then there's also lack of information sharing, which can lead to the loss of mission and loss of customer satisfaction and so on. So UC is leading to all hazards and hazards leading to the losses. And we define different unsafe uh, control actions 
which was more than 150, like I said. And for each of these UCAs then, we try to identify how it can occur. So what are the possible causes behind them? For example, uh, for the UCA1, we have like remote pilot does not insert the communication. Why? Because one of the possible situations is that he lacks the necessary data in order to make the communication. Or he lacks the, like he is fatigued because of over workload. And because of that, he does not, he's not able to insert the communication. So there can be numerous scenarios that could lead to this UCA. As, at the end, like what we had was more than 800 possible scenarios leading to these UCAs, which is used. Then what we did was we categorized them into three major categories, which are like uh, issues related to hardware and software, issues related to human factors, and issues related to data. And there are where, like more than 50 subcategories, for example, for the hardware and software, there's like DHF failure, computer device failure, and for human errors, there's distraction and lack of skills and so on. So in the equipment, so we covered like uh, issues related to gyro, how it could fail, what could be the potential safety controls in order to prevent them, and so on for radar, AIS, GPS, engines, fairway infrastructures, lights, cloud services, displays, and, and like all the equipment that's basically used in pilotage. And then also about the data, because like, uh, it's one of the critical aspects in remote pilot is that everything needs to be shared and so on. So there, there shouldn't be any issues with transferring the SIP dynamic data, SIP information, fairway traffic information, and so on. So there are lots of different kinds of data that needs to be transferred. And then also we had to consider the human factors. Uh, for example, there were subcategories such as lack of skills, fatigue, stress, lack of trust, like we already discussing the morning session, and many more. And then for each of these subcategories, what we did was we went uh, to uh, like in more detail, uh, identifying how it can occur, and what could be the potential safety controls that could uh, like uh, not let it happen, right? So that would prevent them from happening. So for example, for the lack of skills, like there are certain sets of skills that the remote pilot needs to have, for example, he needs to provide like navigation solution, he needs to plan the pilot days and so on. And there are also certain sets of skills that the vessel crew needs to have. And so uh, it needs to be in both ways that all of the, like the vessel crew and the remote pilot needs to be trained in order to successfully and safely do the remote pilot days work, right? So the potential risk control measures for this could be like some of them are already in place, like we already discussed selection of ship and fairway, so there are already simulation practices going on. And uh, also the pilots that we have been using are quite experienced and skilled. And then we also have this duplex communication initial, initial, like installed. And then in the future, maybe we can look into the certification of remote pilots and its validity. Training, required training, like I said, all of the sets of skills that needs to be determined. And then like we also maybe need to identify emergency procedures for remote pilots. So if something goes wrong, how we can quickly like uh, implement conventional biotech in case of these issues. And uh, the last one is increased situational awareness, maybe like we need more installations of camera stations and weather stations on ferry, and also assess new technologies in the future. So once we went through each of these subcategories and identified what can go wrong and implement the safety controls, we also tried to estimate the risk levels for each of these categories based on like uh, how severe the consequences can be if it occurs, if it fails, and how frequently that it can fail. And based on that, we estimated like, uh, we put them into three different categories, like low risk level, medium risk level, and high risk level. So 22 of such subcategories fall into high risk level, nine fall into like uh, medium risk level, and 18 of those into low risk levels. So this is like a preferred estimation. Uh, so these risk levels were implemented before implementing the risk control measures. So before implementing the safety barriers, these are risk levels. And of course, after we implement the risk control measures, they are expected to go down, which we will see in the future. Also, we did the preliminary cost benefit analysis of the risk control measures uh, using like a, like a scale. 
So first we try to define like uh, how effective the defined risk control measures are together with the thin pilot and pilots. Uh, so we generated this scale which has like a one to five with like low, medium, high and very high effectiveness based on this like percentage reduction. So you can see like uh, out of, it was around 230 risk control measures, um, 164 of them were deemed to be very high effectiveness and then 46 of them were like um, categorized into having high effectiveness and there were like all the rest of them with the level of one, two and three. And then we also did the preliminary cost um, analysis, so also using similar kind of scale where there is like a, one means no direct cost, two means the low cost, three means average cost, and four high and very high with five. And then you can see the approximate net cost with the euros of the right. And as you can see for this one, except very high cost, all of them were like equally distributed. Okay. Yes, okay, so this is also something that we have done and are using in our digital articles, is this, the cost benefit analysis of remote pilot operation using inference diagram. So, like for making decisions in a system, like uh, for example, if you want to implement risk control measure or not, you can already assess using this diagram that you know, okay, what is the total expected benefit in terms of cost. Like uh, there is a cost of implementation of our like risk control measure, and also there is a benefit coming from the loss reduction in terms of money. So we can compare them to calculate what is the like the uh, combination that gives you the maximum expected benefit. So like a uh, work concluded and potential next steps. Like I said, 50 plus loss causal factors were identified in this analysis. Um, the risk management strategies are defined into this risk control options to be used as the foundations for the definition of the management system. Like I said, like we need to reiterate this and then like update them accordingly to use this as a basis for the upcoming evaluations and analysis. Um, the output of this work supports the definition of safety requirements related to remote piety. So you, we already saw that there are already some uh, guidelines and uh, requirements related to the Pilots Act. So this work could be used as in like, uh, defining high level safety requirements in the future. And then for the next iterations, the scope of the analysis should be expanded to higher level. So we didn't include management and authorities so far. So also their roles and the safety factors to them should be also analyzed. And then lastly, the defined processes and product information should be also accompanied by the data as soon as we, are, we have this data available. So thank you for listening. We are ready to answer your questions. If thank you. We have time. There's one question. Who is? Carno, please. Uh, how did you uh, analyze the probability of those risks happening? Yes, so we used a scale provided by IMO. Of course, we made a change on that. Uh, depending on because that that scale is available for normal uh, maneuvering and navigation, but in this case it was about remote pilots. So we made some changes depending on like the criticality of the work. So it was a qualitative scale for now. It's because the probability failure of probability is not available until like for the remote pilots. So we are just using qualitative scale like the Likert scale. Um, so you can already take like formal safety assessment and. Uh, there's a scale provided by IMO in the FSA, which we used largely for this purpose. Or should we ask the pilots what they think the probability of each of those risks is? That's what we did, but, but qualitatively, like I said, like yeah. it's not, we are not defining the exact probability of failure, but in this scale, we ask pilots how they see like uh, it happening. And, and, and that, that was the matrix that you used? Yes, okay. so I didn't show you the scale in this one, but okay. all, like throughout this work, we have always involved pilot and their opinion. Uh, I, I, we are engineers, we like probability risk assessment, but I say in this case, no, because we need to build the, the basis of understanding the issue that we have here before we create numbers that are basically given to decision maker. So we need to understand what is behind those numbers before we actually create those numbers. So mm -hmm. that's why in this phase, it's, it's qualitative, but 
we are working already on the next steps. Yes, like we are already creating a risk model that takes like uh, uh, quantitative scales into matter. So it's just replacing now the expert opinions with the exact like uh, failures and so on in the future. Okay, thank you. And next. Novia, University of Applied Science and Critical Ships Data and Remote Production. Please. Yeah. How does this work? So, yeah, okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am today come here to talk about uh, critical ship data in remote pilotage. And uh, I'll start by showing first how to find the critical factors, and then I will present a map of components and uh, discuss some challenging issues that we found. So, it all begins from situational awareness. These are actually the, uh, the critical components of uh, pilotage. Uh, ship's position, ship's dynamic state, ship controls, external environment, and the team dimension. Uh, the pilot reads a combination of information, process system, and uh, makes a forecast for decision. These labels, they are not very informative, so we must open them a little bit. So. I made a map that probably clarifies or makes it a little bit <laughs> more confusing. It's a much more artistic than than <laughs> Yeah, but um, this is a this is um, this is a chart that helps to understand what are the data sources and functions that we need for each of these uh, critical factors. So we have the critical factors: position, ship's dynamic state. Uh, ship controls, team, and then the ex external elements there. So they are connected with these uh, data data items. And uh, this is, um, in effect, the data that is disposal of the onboard pilot. So we start from that. I will show you an example of uh, from around there. So we have a position, and uh, it is uh, to get the situational awareness of the position, we need to know the relative position of the ship on the fairway and on the on the route, and we don't need to know the next waypoint, etc. So what to do? Uh, we need to set the ship uh, in some in, in on a map. So we need to set it on the geographical location. And how do we get this geographical location? Is by using some positioning um, uh, positioning method like GPS, satellite navigation system. So this way, I, I, I constructed this going back to the, to the map. And uh, when we start to look at this from the remote pilotage point of view, uh, what's good, it helps to select the data components that are critical to each of these, each of the critical factors, so com components. So we can say that, okay, we need this component to, uh, to, to uh, get the situational awareness from the external elements. Let's say that, uh, for example, we don't have an interactive radar in our disposal in the remote pilotage uh, center. So, okay, we just uh, justify that we need a collision avoidance function. So we don't, we don't need to uh, require the, the radar signal, but we need to have the functionality. That is what this chart is all about. <laughs> So then some of the issues that I, I have been thinking about, uh, uh, I know that my fellow navigators will definitely uh, disagree when I say that electronic navigation is not reliable. Electronic navigation is not reliable. But think of it when you have the ECDIS uh, electronic chart and the position is coming only from GPS. Uh, can you rely on GPS? I just read about the United States Maritime <coughs> Administration that they had issued an advisory that uh, that there are worldwide instances of significant GPS and AIS interference that affects bridge navigation. So it's it's a reality today. Today, um, anybody who doesn't know what AIS is, it's an automatic identification ship uh, system that helps to put all the ships on the electronic map so that they, they will show us an icons on the electronic map. And uh, yeah, uh, on board, what, what happens if, if a pilot 
uh, is on board and, and he loses or she loses uh, uh, the GPS. Well, they look out, out, out the window or, or they look at the radar. They are searching for familiar objects there to position themselves in the fairway that they know by heart. So, like I said, uh, in my eyes, electronic navigation uh, entirely based on GPS positioning is, is, is not enough. Um, so yeah, here, here you can see that if the position is a little bit off, then something worse happens. I think this is uh, from uh, entering the uh, St. Petersburg. Timo. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, <clears throat> um, another critical factor, dynamic state. Um, the rate of turn is uh, the most critical uh, variable for the rate of turn. And uh, <clears throat> it is a measure of uh, change of heading in degrees per minute. And uh, well, if we if we are navigating electronically, we will have this path predictor to predict the ship's movement. And this path predictor is based on rate of turn, which is a signal coming from the ship. If we cannot trust it, then we cannot trust the predictor. It also the predictor also depends on the speed over ground. So that also surprise surprise it comes from GPS. So if the GPS is wrong, then then that is totally. Nonsense. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, what happens on board if if something is wrong with the rate of turn, then the pilots will and, and what I heard they said that they always uh, look visually the to during the turn, so they always look outside the window when they do the turn. Okay, um, then detecting all traffic. Now, if we don't have the radar, we are in big trouble. This is an, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a EGDIS image that has a radar overlay. Um, all these yellow objects are the are reflections from the uh, radar signal. This is a history path. Uh, the white arrows are the AIS uh, movement vectors. And then there are some vessels there parked and, and some C, C ray comes from something like that. Uh, if we <coughs> remove the radar image, what happens? Yeah, we lose a lot of information. There was something significant. Uh, there, there was some not so significant uh, information on the outside. There's some speedboat going on there and there's some traffic outside the traffic lanes. But uh, what about this? What about this? And maybe that and also this one. What, what are they? They are maybe uh, fishing boats or maybe some leisure boats stopped and or maybe a flock of birds we don't know anyway that they affect affect the navigation okay so looking looking at the future um, some notes about this uh, the project that we we did the remote pilot it's demo situation when we were collecting signals from from the vessel that, that was remote pilotage, we noticed that um, each ship has a custom setup. Bridge equipment usually uses more or less the standard signaling, but the engine automation is the tricky part. Uh, the automation system providers, they have uh, their setups, setups varying between, even between sister vessels. So each ship is a custom commissioning for remote pilotage. Um, yep, the positioning, how to tackle with the positioning issue. Um, there are some new technologies. I just recently read about uh, some Galileo GPS uh, project and uh, they are researching it and uh, it promises an accuracy of 20 centimeters with encryption. It is, it is pretty promising. And uh, recognizing all traffic, the only one we came up is that, okay, let's, we have the fairway that is, um, that is for remote pilotage. So we would require all the crafts and vessels entering the fairway to use AIS, even if it's vulnerable, but it, it shows that there is something there. So, so that, that could help. Yeah. Um, yeah, my final 
take is that uh, if you don't remember anything else, just remember that uh, the remote operations, they require accuracy and, and redundancy. And the, everything is based on situational awareness that the pilot will sustain situational awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Now you can ask him, don't need to. <laughs> Everything was clear. I have one yeah. about your, your artistic description. <laughs> yeah. Is this just a visual description or you, can you use it as a tool? Yeah, I, I, yeah it's, it's, you know, um, it's not very engineering-like or any, anything else. That, uh, it has a mashup of information, something like uh, this is a communication and, and this is a visual observation. And there is some sometimes, uh, for example, squat. You can calculate the squat based on based on maybe some uh, sensor data and based on where you where, where you chart that area also. So this is like a a tool to discuss about what do we need and why do we need why do we need things. Because I see that there's potential also integration of these descriptions into actually the tools that we have used to start to describe the data and the mm -hmm. insurance. Yeah, to make the risk analysis yeah. and, and pick up the most uh, uh, important functions to, to make up the critical factors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most of these tools they provide outputs as the XML extension device, so which is which you can like, integrate into different tools. You can take that as a mentor, so yeah, it's super possible to integrate. Yeah. Yeah. Also, what like uh, <coughs> what kind of method that you used in order to make the predictions? Is it deep learning or no 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 nothing nothing like that fancy it's just a just a thought process because my background is uh, engineering and uh, and uh, maritime I'm a I'm a master mariner so I kind of know this by heart so I just wanted to open it up for the anybody who doesn't you know have the required knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank, Thank you. Just you have the uh, picture of, of the vessel and the predictor and the fairway at the San Pedro. Uh, what, what do you mean? Uh, there is the picture of the Varsila unit uh, or the photo, uh, the screen capture of the Varsila unit. Just go a little bit forward. There. Uh, yeah, yeah. That one. Mm. Just to highlight the importance, what the Yen just told us is that. This is exactly the place where you got that, get actually uh, GPS uh, jamming. That is the fairway to St. Petersburg, and close to it is a place where the, Mr. Putin is ha having his uh, summer house. So, and that exact corner is uh, or a turn is uh, such that you are the Kaliningrad is north of it, and there is the naval base in that that position. So, if you miss that turn, you will end up to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the naval base of, of uh, Russia, and which is not a good thing. <laughs> and this is this is where I have experienced by myself that you really need to look outside, and that the predictor might fail exactly in this kind of situation. And it is very critical to start the turning on on a proper time. Yeah, yeah. I, I know this corner as well. Maybe this was a fake fake image then. This was <laughs> <laughs> just for demonstration. Yeah. To continue what you said that uh, I was working before back then I was trans as I was going through some people were discussing about this and those guys working with these tools knew every time when Mr. Putin came to this summer place because mm. the GPS was totally channeled from that area mm. and our Lake Simo area pilots also knew. Mm. Yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the next presentation will be uh, <coughs> Lena and Jan Salkan. Now I have to go Which in one order. I don't mind. I do. They already met. Okay. okay. Just a complete and take over. Yes, hello, my name is Jana Salkanel. I'm from Nokia University of Applied Sciences. And um, I'm talking more about um, the remote pilot point of view and um, from the human factors point of view. And a little bit like Osiris here said that we have been working like 
for about two years now. So this is just a small, small, some key points of everything that we have discovered. And um, most likely, uh, a lot of things have come up already, uh, but we are trying to explain them a little bit in a more profound way. But anyway, uh, we have been eliciting uh, the knowledge of, of experts, the pilots, uh, through interviews, observations, workshops, and simulator exercises. So we have been cooperating for some time now, which has been really interesting. So uh, in the beginning, we started off with uh, uh, defining this kind of uh, remote piloting process. Um, to understand, and then we studied the information needs in relation to decision making, uh, task accomplishment, and technological development. So, so we were studying this, and at the same time doing the specific cases for the for the technological solutions. And then we have also thought about operational procedures because we needed also to understand that what's different between traditional piloting and remote piloting. So basically what changes, uh, what needs to be done differently and why it needs to be done, uh, done differently. And then this communication was, which has been coming up quite many times, that also that uh, when things change and you need to do different uh, things differently, you also need to focus on the communication and it communication plays quite big role. And then simulator exercises, uh, together with the remote pilots, we can practice the same things again and again. We try different kind of things and, and we test, tested different kind of hypothesis together. And um, then we made research, uh, especially related to safety, uh, situational awareness and decision making. So some key points. Um, the starting point, if you think about the current situation, uh, at the moment when uh, ships enter Finnish waters and the pilots pilot them from, from the pilot station to, to the harbor or vice versa, there is quite a wide variation of competence at the moment because the, the pilots cannot control who comes to the Finnish waters and who will be the one, but usually they get the, um, the work done and, and the piloting process is a success. And uh, at the moment also pilots physically navigate the vessels uh, approximately between 80% and 90% uh, mainly from a uh, pilot station to have a limit when the captain takes over and takes the um, uh, ship to, to uh, morse the ship or then sometimes also they go all the way especially in the ice, I mean, ice conditions and like this. And um, this has created a little bit of lack of trust towards the competencies of the seafarers. Um, then about this kind of non-verbal com uh, communication that has been coming up here. So basically, um, due to the high level of variation, uh, research shows that approximately uh, around 70 to 80 percent of communication between human beings is actually non-verbal. And um, it includes this kind of body language, facial impressions, um, different kind of movements, behavior, whatever you do with your body. And this has actually been an interesting point because um, mm. From the starting uh, discussions with the pilots, they actually go on board and they intuitively and uh, mentally analyze the crew and they, they get the feeling about what is the situation in this particular situation. And after that, uh, their skills, competencies, atmosphere, are they tired, what kind of teamwork, what is the, the uh, kind of dynamics of it and they actually adjust their uh, piloting style according to the situation. And it's not always, they are not very aware, it comes naturally because they have a lot of experience and they adapt 
And uh, then they uh, change um, their behavior, for example, being more formal, depending, or informal. They can be more relaxed. Uh, if they for the group competence, if they are very competent, the pilot can step back. But if they need more accurate or formal uh, advice or stronger touch in this piloting process, they start to adapt to that one too. And also uh, about this nonverbal communication, we can see uh, crew behavior can also be this kind of nonverbal feedback loop. They also observe the group behavior while giving comments or advice. For example, simply that uh, this came up here also that when they give a command to uh, that uh, slow down, for example, or speed up or turn, so it doesn't always include uh, verbal communication, uh, but you, they actually observe their hands, their behavior, and what they do. And that has been a, some kind of nonverbal feedback. And then they know that actually what they have asked is being executed correctly. And sometimes, of course, they are active themselves. Like, for example, by navigating uh, the vessel independently. So what happens now in remote piloting? We need certification. And this is also basically about uh, decreasing the variability that is happening at the moment. Uh, because the, the crew comes and, and, but in the future, in the remote piloting, we cannot have this wide variation. But so we need certification to, to narrow it down like this. And, and it also uh, relates to the, the creation of trust. Of course, uh, the pilot needs to trust the crew and they need to trust also the whole system that it works because they cannot see them anymore, not in the same way as being on, and they are not in control anymore in the same way. Uh, and this certification, as we've been discussing, is a quite strategic question, um, because uh, it's going to be a question of service and how much, what kind of vessels and crew to include. So it has to be decided that where do we draw the line, what kind of vessels can we uh, include, how much variation can we tolerate with the current technological system and all this. But this also, also remote piloting and this kind of situation uh, changes the role uh, back uh, to pilot being an advisor. So the remote pilot is an advisor. This meaning that it requests more uh, active uh, behavior from the crew and naturally competent. So, so they cannot uh, come and, and give over the vessel anymore. So they, they need to be active. And uh, now, uh, for example, when they are on the ship, this kind of visually uh, received feedback um, which can be, for example, also non-verbal. So it has been noted that now the increase of communication between the vessel and the, the remote pilot needs to increase because now they need to compensate everything that has been non-verbal feedback with verbal feedback. So they are uh, both uh, getting the feedback from, from and the, the, the feedback loop is, is ongoing. Uh, by checking the information from the equipment as well as, as verbally. So the crew actually, we have tested in this simulator and, and the crew actually needs to inform uh, more uh, what they are doing to the remote pilot if they are not able to see what they are doing. So then they need to verbally and then of course to keep up the, the close loop of feedback a uh, remote pilot needs to confirm, and this we have been practicing also in the simulator. Um, this requires possibly training and practice because it is a new way of working. It might be that the crew, or vessel crew, for example, the captains are not so used continuously to say things, or maybe they are, but this can be seen then and, and see how much training they need. 
but um, and then this kind of standards communication, um, the communication needs to be more standardized also. Uh, when they discuss, they cannot go on and talk too much. It has to be very clear, very simple, and very understandable for all. And discipline, naturally, in these kind of days. So when um, this whole process comes more formal, it requires discipline also from the people to obey. <coughs> And also this uh, kind of communication, just shortly, that that uh, when stress level uh, rises, then communication style can change, and this re relates to the discipline and training. Then shortly about the fairways, but I think we discussed this quite much. But uh, the, not all fairways are suitable, necessary, at least in the beginning for remote piloting. Uh, there was some analysis already made. So as conclusions, um, losing the ability to visually observe as on board the vessel status, the crew behavior and operational environment is seen one of the major uh, issues that has basically taken, been taken away from, from remote pilots and uh, no technological solutions exist yet. So, so this is something that, that needs uh, development, technological development, in order to gain back to the level or even safer, a better level. Um, some parts can be uh, compensated with technological solution, but some parts actually are question of doing just things differently. We cannot expect technology to solve everything, but sometimes just doing different. And here, just shortly, in relation to to Yedis also that ice detect fa vessel, fa vessel movements faster than the equipment in slow movements and close water situations and small objects like without AIS mm, uh, cannot be detected. So it's it clear technology development is needed. Um, actually, this haptic response was not seen an issue, and um, neither the fact that the remote pilot becomes more advisor and not being able to control the vessel. And lastly, attitudes are both very positive towards real attitude. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yes, so my name is Arne Leinonen. I'm from uh, Alta University School of uh, uh, Arts and uh, from the service design perspective. So uh, this presentation is about uh, taking the pilot's perspective and I'll be giving like, uh, concrete examples on usability and user experience related issues about the uh, remote piloting station. Uh, I observed and interviewed the pilots. Uh, so this was the remote pilot's demo station. And uh, you've seen the picture. Now there are the labels, what are the tools actually here? Present so connection devices, information from the ship and from the fairway, and uh, some context information. So, um, the overall screen setup was demo flashy, not pilot usable, <laughs> sorry to say. Uh, but uh, uh, this was the pilot's perspective. Uh, this, was, this is an image from the uh, eye tracking device. So, the pilot. Um, um, was looking at the radar and then they were looking at the furthest corner of the setup, <laughs> the camera that came from the ship. Uh, so that was one practical thing. So if these sort of things are not taken in consideration when designing this setup, this will result in like poor conditions for the remote pilot. Um, another uh, issue that came up in the demo was that there was a altering delay and that uh, altering delay from uh, uh, from the ship data so it wasn't clear was it like a five second delay or was it 50 second delay and um, the delay is something that the pilots uh, it's like the bread and butter that they do they estimate what is the delay of the ship movement but if the delay from the uh, devices from the ship alter and they don't know what is the delay. It's pretty hard to uh, do the 
estimation of the future position of the ship. Um, also, like practical things, voice quality. Uh, so in the demo setup, uh, the um, uh, recording uh, voice from the bridge game, something like laptop or some uh, touch uh, speakers. So that was uh, too poor quality to actually uh, pick up uh, small signals from the ship bridge. So again, like uh, when we try this out in practice, we find these sort of things from the user's perspective. Uh, one issue was uh, also like uh, display brightness, like uh, in dark conditions, you could squeeze out um, more information from the uh, camera setup by just uh, uh, brightening the display, or then we need to buy some uh, more expensive cameras and uh, something like that. And uh, also, as a positive edge note to the usability part, uh, uh, the majority of the functions that were needed are already there in the uh, demo remote piloting uh, station. Uh, but uh, some like um, something was missing, but still overall picture is good. Uh, and the physical ergonomics of the uh, station was very good. Uh, user perspective, uh, user experience point of view is that uh, pilot safety increases. That is a, the positive side, uh, but uh, the work context is a bit different because uh, it's uh, working with a computer screen. Um, then we gather some uh, questionnaire uh, information about the system, how 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 the system um, uh, was experienced. So it was technical and takes takes me distant from other people. It is inno innovative. It is new. These were some uh, like findings from here. Um, and one key point uh, of having the radar and the image and every every system that will be inter integrated in the remote pilot station should be integrated in the same screen so that the uh, information is there available and not behind some uh, other interactive uh, screen in other corner of the map so it, it would be easy to look the same screen with uh, the information would be there. So some ideas more powerful like this uh, radar overlay to take this uh, and uh, the other systems that were in different screens could be uh, integrated in the one. And uh, also uh, from pilot's perspective, the ground perspective, if there's a radar in the shore, it's really odd for the pilots to um, take that perspective because they have learned to learn the fairway from the ship's perspective. They know what the radar imi image looks from the ship, but it is hard to interpret that from, from the shore radar image. Um, and also, this goes uh, together with the screen theme, but also with the technical stuff that is uh, going to be put there to enable, enable the remote piloting. So the uh, remote, pilot it's, uh, remote pilots will become almost a helpline about the technical issues that the ship face if, if the uh, camera adjustments, the microphones are off or something is not working. They probably need some sort of training to help the uh, ship bridge crew to fix those issues. And uh, altogether, the remote piloting demo showed uh, potentials, and in the demo conditions, uh, it was uh, good, and some fixes are needed the usability issues and the ECDIS, ECDIS version, for example. Thank you. Okay, questions, comments? <clears throat>
I have two, two questions, one for uh, Johan and one for Arne. Uh, we talked since the morning about this communication issue, and then you basically started to mention these bullet points on the standardized communication. I'm wondering if you took any examples from the learning experience, for example, in BTS with the MESA markers. No, um, we haven't gone that far yet. But it was more that we practiced the, com the communication and, and the pilot tried different kind of ways. But this is something that... But the info for standardized and based on the work we did many years ago in strong winds, this is something mm -hmm. to take in consideration. Yeah. The good things and the bad things about the, yeah. the issue with the masses versus Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is like a, some of you said that it's, it's about learning a new language also. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and for Arne, uh, for this uh, classification of the things that you see there, what kind of a scale do you use for that? For example, what means poor for you? How they, oh, everybody can understand what is the meaning of the poor perception. You go there in order to understand what is the current situation for us and then to think about how to improve it. Because I found a little bit via that you tell me that only you think it's poor. So. Yeah. Uh, it is a subjective, uh, uh, not an exact measure. Okay. More, more of a perception of the okay. uh, pilot step. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I would like to ask about uh, virtual reality glasses. Is this system tested at all for the pilots? Uh, because uh, I was testing the system in EMSA. They were testing virtual, virtual reality glasses in uh, ship inspection. And it was really like being on board the vessel, going around the vessel, you could do whatever with the glasses. So it was, it was like in the real vessel. If the pilot on the remote station could use virtual reality glasses, he could be like on the bridge of the vessel. Could that be an option? Um. Probably no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because the ships would need some recording data if, if they want to uh, give the idea of what is happening in the bridge. Yeah, but they are regularly going to... to when we look to finish uh, shipping, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we have about 80% of the vessels are regularly coming to St. Paul. So it's not a problem to record uh, the yeah. environment. So if the environment is recorded, so it is there. Of course, uh, the conditions uh, are different, but it doesn't matter. Can I have to comment on So this is successfully tested, uh, not remote piloting, but remote operation of Tag Vessel in German. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's possible. But uh, uh, if you think about that, uh, one remote pilot could have a uh, eight hours shift or something like that. Uh, the the uh, glasses are quite heavy, and that might be uh, one issue. There are also some some lighter ones, that, uh, but uh, but yeah, that's that's interesting yeah. uh, issue to be tested. And there are one at least one process that are under planning where <coughs> the idea is to compare uh, VR glasses. And, and, uh, I'd like to ask without. one question. Did you mean uh, by these glasses that the, the pilot would see the same thing that the captain does? Yes, exactly. Just right. He's like on the bridge of the vessel and he can see the same environment At the same as moment. the captain. Yes, exactly. Online. So it would, it would not be kind of a virtual reality? It's like a real picture. What the yeah, master but I mean, on the bridge it would be the actual. Yeah, exactly. At the same time. Yeah. yeah. How about the and other traffic? He can, he can like move on the bridge, he can walk from side to side on the bridge, and then he can see yeah. the differences. So, maybe just uh, we, we have uh, tested VR boxes for some for simulations. There are companies who are uh, doing training simulators for VR boxes. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, I'm not at all opposed to, uh, to it, but there are several issues to be tackled related to the overall simulation and the added information. So, uh, 
And they, they are developing, they, they are fast developing yeah. technology at the moment. We're not going to neglect the routine yeah. that also, but the, then yes. um, another thing is, of course, you mentioned that about the 80% of the party, the same ships being mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those ships uh, are the ones having decks, not yeah, pilots. Exactly. So when we're doing remote pilots, we're actually looking at a lot more diverse group of, of ships and uh, giving challenges to what kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. And our starting point has always been to try to do it as so like a, a robust system, not going into being a lot to the base. But I, I fully agree with you, that's something to do, maybe. Thank you. Okay. This was impressive. Uh, findings which you have done, that I'm really like a wall that what you have done, because I have a guts that this might be the way it, the things are, but the, seeing the results, research the results is like a very positive thing. I remember from the virtual classes that uh, they tested this with the lock truck and the crane operator of the lock truck, and the, the guy was able to operate the crane for a couple of minutes. And after that, he started to feel bad. Okay, I'm sweating. Two reasons. At the morning, I, 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 I uh, insulted the lawyers, and I know that there is not only captains, but lawyers in the, <laughs> in, the, in the room. And the second thing is that there are people who are able to disagree with me heavily on this subject. Because law is all about a uh, matter of uh, uh, opinion or uh, good opinion. Uh, liability aspects of the, of the remote uh, pilots in Finland. As you see, this all, all already says something about the subject. This is only applicable to Finland and in some way to Scandinavia. Because of, of, of the legislation is national. It's not international, as Sana has said already, so, so, so we have to keep this in mind. What I have been doing in my previous life I was in the University of Turku and uh, doing my master's thesis there about this subject. Nowadays I'm working for ESL Shipping and there I'm a one of the cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> or in a, an another way in my, in, in, in my uh, if you go to the web pages it says uh, claims manager or legal counsel. Uh, I was, what I did was to Take a look on the legislation, what we have here on, on the remote politics, because nobody had uh, made a research what is the effect on the liability issues. There have been some uh, thoughts on the government's proposal, but it was not uh, uh, iterated uh, to forward. But what I have been thinking that the, that the lawyers are not only cockroaches, they are also people who enable things. We have been talking about the trust today a lot, that there need to be some trust uh, and there is some uh, invaluable uh, things which are now lacking, so we need to talk, uh, talk about them more truly. And what I try to do is to find also a legal way or the uh, legislation uh, possibilities which might build the trust to the system inside of the of the realm of politics. Uh, I didn't look to the contracts. So this is not about the charter parties or something like this. It's only the things which are happening when you like uh, run the ship to the ground or something like that. So it's only thought and not to the contracts. They always have the disclaimer that this is not uh, uh, very, very uh, throughout analysis of the ship owner, because ship owner can be anything. In this, uh, this uh, 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 study, a ship owner is the most classic way that the guy who owns the ship right, and, and runs the ship, operates the ship and such. One big key thing is that I had the biggest chunk of the information I was missing was the permit itself, the, the, the remote piloting permit which is issued by Trafico. And therefore, some of the, of, of the things which are, I'm discussing here are just a matter of uh, uh, thoughts that how it should be or how it could be. Uh, what we need to do when we talk about the law is that we need to talk about which law we are talking about. So we are talking about the Finnish Maritime Code, Merilaki in Finnish, 
Quality Check and also uh, Tort Liability Act, Vahingonkorvauslaki. About the Quality Check, uh, as uh, Sam already told, there is a comprehensive uh, changing of the legislation. It doesn't affect so much to the remote pilot, it's, uh, it doesn't uh, cover that part, but there are some issues which might uh, might uh, change the, the, the results of this uh, study if they are analyzed further. I have just thought about them, but not the... Uh, I mean, I talked about them yesterday, but not on this analysis, because the, the, the uh, change, uh, legislation change started after this uh, study. What is the uh, idea, basic idea in the, in the uh, marine uh, um, uh, liabilities is that uh, it's only on the fault or negligence in the basic, uh, basic situation. It means that uh, it is the act or omission, so you have to do something or you, you didn't do something uh, which has something to relate to the accident. And then this thing has to be blameworthy. This is the basic situation in, in, the, uh, in, in the liability. So if you did something or you didn't, some, didn't do something which you should do, then there is something which you are playing for it, and then you might have a, a problem with that in a, in a layman's uh, language. A vicarious liability is something that an uh, uh, employer is, uh, uh, will be liable in damages for any damage caused by the employee. So if you're okay doing something, is doing some, something uh, wrong, the company will pay. But in shipping, it's also, also the servants of the ship owners. It means that the tugboats and the pilots, if they do something wrong, then the ship owner is liable about that. Uh, strict liability means that whatever happened, the negligence is required, and, and, and there, uh, there only needs to be some relevant link to the accident with this uh, guy who is liable now. This is on the legislation. <laughs> Flow chart, which is not so visible to the back row, and it is also in Finnish, but I tried to explain something what is going on here. This uh, my right hand side on your right hand side. This is the normal procedure of, of a, a pilot. It's up today. What, what it is today? Guys who, who can do something wrong are the pilot and the master of the vessel. There is basically uh, on board the ship, it is all, always about the master or the pilot who did something wrong. And who will pay the damages in these cases? If you flow, uh, go with the flow chart, whatever you do, you end up to the ship owner. This is the basic, basic situation that if there is some, something which was an act or omission, so you did something wrong or you didn't do something proper, the uh, end result of the liability goes to the ship owner. But now, we are talking about the remote politics, and it adds something to the picture. At the, at the, there, up there, there is a, a remote politics uh, 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 accident or incident. Oh, the vessel goes to a ground, so let's say like this. Now we start to think that uh, who, we sh who we should blame about this. Legislation says in the remote politics, uh, 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 about in the Bill Pilotage Act, it's uh, uh, yet, uh, uh, today it says that that <laughs> if the shipma shipmaster did something wrong, it goes to the uh, ship owner. If the pilot did, pilot did something wrong, it goes to the ship owner. But then there is a big but. If there was a technical failure in the system. Of the, the remote pilot system, then it is at the moment it is said that it is not the fault of a pilot. 
but whose uh, who's fault it is at, at the moment. This is a very, very, very important uh, situation because there is, this gives a, a potential uh, conflict to the, between the pilot and the pilotage company. If there is not such a beautiful and uh, talented and, uh, and uh, kind person as Sanna is now working on the pilotage company, if there is a evil Sanna, <laughs> there might be a conflict between the pilot and the pilotage company. It means that the pilotage company, it have, if he, they have an opinion that there was nothing wrong with the system, there was a wrong in the pilot, the, play, the, the liability goes to the ship owner. But if the pilot says there was problem with the system, it was not my fault, and that, that opinion wins, then the fault goes to the pilotage company on a certain situation. Because the politics company, they need to prepare to the accidents. They need to be ready for accidents and they have to mitigate them. If they don't mitigate, they have already made something wrong. So there is a, po a potential uh, situation that, that, that they might be liable for the damages. And the basic situation is that if, the, if something happened during the politics, in politics, plots of just it says in the Finnish legislation, then they have a possibility to reduce their liability to 100,000 uh, euros, which is not so much. But if that something didn't happen during the pilotage, and let's say that it is a technical failure, then they cannot uh, uh, limit their liability and they need to pay the whole bill. Jussi, what about the third party responsibility when we think about uh, the system supplier. Mm. If you can prove that there is something wrong in the system. I'm about to come to that okay. point. <laughs> now, building the trust, key takeaways. As I said, there is a potential that the voltage company cannot limit their liability. But then there might be situations when the, when the guy who's uh, Summer house has been uh, totally collapsed because of the ship came to it, something like this, just from, from, uh, from the era took this idea. He might have to prove that, uh, or he has to show in the uh, Finnish legislation that it was that guy who did something wrong. And there might be a problem because the politics company might be willing to be silent that how their system is working. They might be silent about how who did they bought the data, who provided the data, what kind of a system they are running. And they are not able to say some of these things, because some of the data comes from the authorities which are not able to speak about. The, 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 the radars might be in the same tower with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the army or navy. So they are not able to say that, okay, it was actually the navy who did something to their equipment and then this and this and happened. So there is a bit problems with this because you have to show that, that somebody was involved. So what I'm proposing here is that because now the uh, pilot is servant of the ship owner, I think that it actually should be that the pilot is servant of the ship uh, 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 of the pilot its company. So there is no this kind of a conflict of interest. And secondly. I'm proposing that the politics company should take uh, in so how to say this in layman's word that uh, they should be uh, liable for any 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 situation when, when there is a, 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 a not liable but they should be they should have burden of proof that their system was not uh, 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 making this accident, let's say like this. They have to provide the evidence that it actually was not their systems. This affects so that the pilotage company, they have to really make their system work very, very well. 
This also provides the uh, good thing that the pilot and the pilot is company don't have a conflict of interest and they, they trust to each other. So this everything provides that the master gets information which is most more, more trustworthy. So this is what I said about how to build the uh, uh, trust to the legislation. I'm about to run over my time and uh, taking your coffee time. So therefore I have to be very brief in this. But if you have any questions or discussion, please be free to uh, uh, take time of the other people's time in the coffee break. So any questions? <laughs> just, uh, just short. Um, thinking about uh, the third party liability and, and if something happens there, so everything is recorded. To my understanding, everything that the remote file of this must be recorded. So there is a clear availability of the of the let's say proof. You can find out the proof and so what has happened, what kind of actions the pilot has taken, if the pilot has taken the right actions and still accident happened. So you have to that find out. recording doesn't happen if the authorities doesn't require it in the parent. They have to be very, very uh, certain that this and this and this is required. If they don't require this kind of uh, uh, proof thing, I think I think the pilot should uh, require this kind of uh, recording because it's a, it's a, uh, their uh, interest. Uh, to it have is this their kind interest. Of there should be some kind of uh, uh, AI. Uh, I mean that VDR in the in the, yeah, 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 in the yeah, room of the, of the remote pilot and so all the discussions, all the orders, uh, all the let's say data which is collected uh, when the vessel is on the fairway. Mm. But anyhow, you have to actually, I think that these both methods have to be applied. Technology and something about the legislation. Any further questions? Sam, please. Yeah, uh, but first about the recording, I don't see a possibility that it wouldn't be the PPUs at this moment that I used to record everything that they are doing and the VDRs on board the bridge and Many of the autonomous shipping uh, testing have, are based on VDR data exchange, so I think that's a, a necessity. Many of the things, uh, first of all, I, I understand fully what uh, you see saying, because those are the in issues to be solved before we even dare to think about doing more findings. And the first pilot, yesterday, you uh, was referring to our yesterday's meeting with the authorities, the standardization and the transparency of these functionalities we have to take to a totally new, new level before we can do anything. Mm. Luckily, we are doing it a bit already for the traditional politics with the new law. Uh, but then for, with both you and the previous speakers, I would like to thank because the things that you take up are the things that we have now during the C4 Value Farewell project are those with, that we consider the prerequisites of the remote mm. pilots. Those are the issues that we see that we, without tackling them, them, we will never do remote pilots. And that's why we thought that we can never do it out, out on our own, or, or neither can the research side. Mm -hmm. so, and you. if you have the burden of proof, then they will provide the data. But if they don't have burden of proof, they don't provide the data to the guy who suffered the, uh, the, the, the damage. And, and one more additional thing, because mm -hmm. we as Perfect's organization, we actually think that we buy the service. We're not developing the, the systems. So in fact, the shipping owner will buy and it will be standardized and Marcus beside me here will, and Tilga there will be providing high technology. So we need to involve uh, the detection of failure. We talked earlier about the detection of failures in whether it's cybersecurity or whatever. So there is a big network of operators that will totally change the present situation. I was only thinking this uh, from uh, this point of view. In EMSA, we recorded all the vessel movements on, on European waters. We also collected the environmental conditions uh, from the satellite. Mm. And in the case of spillage, we played back so we could see, say almost 100% sure which vessel was the polluter. Mm. And in some countries, in some cases, we provided the, the Court of Justice this information. And in UK, in Croatia, the masters have been convicted based on this information. This was provided by them. Yeah, but this goes to the ship owner. If let's say that the, we can continue this on the on the copy break, this is just the final thing that if that mistake is in the code, who will uh, get access to the code? Does the layman has a 
capabilities of uh, checking the code that whether it has a problems or not. So the, it is not about the, uh, physically what happened, but you have to pinpoint who you will blame. Exactly. Yeah. And if you are not able to blame that it was actually the uh, uh, co company providing the uh, 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 video uh, or the company who built the cable or the company who built the equipment or the code, you are in big troubles uh, as, a, uh, as a cottage owner who just suffered a big accident because of the ship <laughs> came to his house. <laughs> one more word, resilience. Please. We will not do remote pilot so that we are dependable on one system. Mm. So the res resilience of the system. Yes, of course. There needs to be all of these yeah. things. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.